Good morning. Today is November 10th, 2024 at West Valley Grace Fellowship. Pastor Dave Haver, and today we're going to be looking at, uh, or starting a small series looking at the Messianic Psalms. But before we get into that, let's uh, open in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and love toward us. We thank you that your word tells us that you are in control of everything. And in the world that seems crazy and upside down, we know that you're still on your throne. Nothing's taken you by surprise and that your eternal purpose will come to pass. And we thank you for that stability that it gives us and the comfort it gives us while we wait for that glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the Messianic Psalms are those that, um, I guess you say, are prophetic. They look forward to the coming of Christ and either his first or second advents, or they look forward to the, uh, uh, the Messianic kingdom or the millennium. Uh, some people, I guess, debate which ones are considered Messianic and which ones are not, but for the purpose of this study, we'll be looking at uh, Psalm 16, 22, 34, 35, 40, 41, and 69. Now, it's interesting if you uh, turn over to Acts chapter 2 for just a minute before we go to Psalm 16. Acts chapter 2 and verse 29 where we see that Pete, the Apostle Peter called David a prophet. He's known as a psalmist, but um, here he says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, speaking of David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, speaking of David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So David knew about the, you know, what we call the Davidic covenant. Um, although there were certain, certainly many things, as Peter wrote in his epistles, that the prophets wrote about that they really didn't understand what they were writing about. So having said that, if you turn to Psalm 16, let's read through, it's only 11 verses. We're going to read through Psalm 16, then we'll come back and analyze it. Psalm 16, verse 1 says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, You are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you, as for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. The drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Uh, if you don't have a handout, there should be some in the back. If you don't, follow along. But um, so we look here in verse one. He says, "Preserve me, O God, for you I put my trust." Now, to preserve, I mean, some of us grew up, you know, when, with your grandmother, your mother making preserves, right? And I went through a process and it preserved the fruit. So that's, that's Basically, what the word means to to protect, to preserve, or keep safe. So David trusted God to keep him safe. A couple of the translations render it as uh, contemporary English version says, "I run to you for safety." International Standard says, "I take refuge in you." 
So it's kind of the same thing. You know, when you get scared, where do you go? You know, when you were a kid, you get you know, lightning might scare you. You go, mama, mama. You could run to mom, or that was always a test of which parent was the favorite, right? When something bad happened, did they run to mom or did they run to dad? Uh, so anyway, Psalm 16. Like all the prophetic psalms, they have double reference. They concern things that happened at the time and also have double reference to things happening in the future. And we can see how this, uh, this verse applies to the Lord Jesus Christ as well because in his earthly ministry, he certainly trusted in God the Father. Your references there, Matthew 26, 39 and 42, are speaking of when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed and you know how he ended his prayers. He prayed three times, and he ended up with what? Not my will, but your will be done, speaking to the Father. And in Luke uh, 23, 46, not only during his ministry, but at the end of his life on the cross, notice how the Lord, his last words. It says, and when Jesus has cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So, he had complete trust in God the Father. And throughout his ministry, he talks about, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. So we see that throughout the Lord's ministry. And so in application, though, who do we, in whom do we trust? What do we run to when things get hard? Well, is it money? Just read a few of these uh, verses here for you. Psalm 62.10 says, If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Which is kind of similar to Proverbs 23.5, which says, Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. Isn't that the truth, right? It takes you a whole week to earn it, and you can spend it in one hour or less, right? One, one bill comes in, and it wipes out the whole paycheck. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, notice that he said, uh, command those who are rich. He didn't say suggest or uh, just mention it to them. He said, command those who are rich in this present age. Again, there's always that contrast in Paul about eternity in the here and now and Paul says well you're yeah you're you may be rich now in this present age but but he says don't be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches again he's echoing what the Psalms and Proverbs said don't trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy so we're not supposed to put our trust in money and uh, the way the stock market goes and if you want to get depressed, just pull up your uh, investment sheet every day and look at it. And you, you're elated one day and you're depressed the next day, and uh, it's a roller coaster. Don't trust in that. Paul talks about we are not Paul in Peter's epistles. You know we have an inheritance reserved in heaven for you, undefiled, incorruptible. It's it's in the sure bank of heaven. We're not supposed to trust in people. They always let us down. Psalm 118.9 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes or rulers. Hey, we just had an election. Are you trusting in man? You're going to be disappointed. Even though a lot of people are happy about what happened on Tuesday, you expect if you're expecting all those promises to be kept, you're going to be disappointed. Don't put your confidence in man. Do you trust in yourself? Psalm 44, 6, David says, I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. In the scripture, you always see that partnership, right? You, it doesn't teach you're supposed to just sit there and go, I'm not going to do anything. The Lord's going to make it happen. No. At the same time, you know, it's like the farmer. Well, I'm dropped down and give me a crop. Did you, did you plant anything? No. Well. Same on the other side of the same coin, though, the farmer plows the field, plants the seed, and then he has to sit back and wait because God brings the rain. No one can explain how a seed germinates and then it comes up and produces the crop. So it's always a partnership of that. Or do we trust in God? And by the way, if you go through the Psalms, if you catch your little electronic concordance, just type the word trust and 
isolate that search to the book of Psalms, you'll see that it comes up 50 times in the book of Psalms. Trust in the Lord, or trust in God, or something along those lines. So Psalm 56, 3 to 4 says, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. So like we're the kids, right? Lightning claps and we get scared, where do we run to? David says, well, when I get scared, I run to God. Verse 4 says, in God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Or what can man do to me? Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 8, right? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. We don't have to fear. Verse 2 here in Psalm 16, he says, Oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. So, again, that echoes from the New Testament. Uh, apart from God, what's well, John 15, 5, you know, and that talks about the vine and the branches, right? It says, and I think that's emphatic, right? The Lord is saying, I am the vine. Let's get this straight. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can't do very much. Is that right? Without me, you can do nothing. Paul says the same thing uh, basically in Philippians 2, 12 to 13, where he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're not working to get it. You're working out what's already in there. He says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Any, any good inclination to will or any good thing that we do, it all comes from the Lord through the Holy Spirit who's working through us. So again, it's that part. We can't just sit there and go, oh God, I was going to sit here and let you do great things through me. That's like the farmer who knows doesn't plant a crop. He puts the seed in the ground. Okay, God, I'm waiting on faith for you to do something big. It's not going to happen, right? It's a partnership. Verse 3, uh, As for the saints who are on earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. So David delighted. Do you believe that he actually liked going to church? He delighted going to the congregation and fellowshipping with other believers. And we should too, right? Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Hmm. It's one thing to love somebody. It's something else to like them, right? I think liking them is sometimes harder than loving them. 1 John 3.14.21 He says, We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. In other words, we know Christ's love because he demonstrated that by dying for us on the cross. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children. I like the way he puts it, right? It's like he's like he's I'm talking to you like you're kids. You're, you're displaying this kind of an attitude. So my my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So it's one of the same years are when we walk as we should, it gives us confidence that we're in the Lord. Because verse 20 says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And then John 4, 20, 21 just says, Well, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he, does not, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves. The other says in Hebrews, uh, Romans 14, 19 talks about we should pursue or chase after the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify 
one another. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 is where Paul lists the, uh, the purpose. He talks about edifying the whole church, how the church, each member has its gift, and we work those together to edify the body of Christ. Verse 4 of uh, 16 says, Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. So here David is pretty much echoing the very first commandment back in Exodus 23. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And Paul echoes that in 1 Timothy 2.5. That's where he says, and I know it's very politically incorrect to say it today, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There is no other. He talks about drink offerings of blood. That re that's referring to child sacrifice. And you go throughout the Old Testament uh, and the history of the Canaanites, that was a, uh, a very, you know, and it, it's interesting, uh, a lot of, Books and articles written about the great Mayan culture, and they're finding all these things in Peru, and, all. and now they're finding out how that society was built around child sacrifice by the thousands. It's the same thing we had back in um, the Old Testament time. Psalm 106, 37 and 38 talks about they even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. Now again, you put scripture to scripture, demons refers to the idols. And Paul talks about that in Corinthians too. Well, I know idols in themselves are nothing, but they represent and are empowered by demons. So here, so Leviticus 18, 21 talks about, uh, you should not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech. Um, so all that's speaking of that. Jeremiah 32, 35, that verse says, um, they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination. So that was something that was a continuous thing to these false idols. And it wasn't just some benign thing. It was, it was brutal murder of children. And I won't mention abortion in any parallels there. I'll just skip right along. But they weren't supposed to do that, and not only that, we're not even to swear by the name of a false god or speak its name. Uh, Exodus 23, 13 talks about, make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. If some people think that means you shouldn't. They weren't supposed to be uh, worshiping, making that name in worship or making that name of other god and, and taking an oath. And some thinks it means it's just an absolute, don't even, I don't even want to hear that on your, in your lips. Uh, Joshua 23, 7 mentions that. It says, You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them, and you shall not serve them nor bow down to them. So there he kind of mentions all three. Don't mention their name, don't swear by them, don't worship them. Verse 5 here says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. So what is our inheritance? Well, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, one of those great passages. Our inheritance, remember in Matthew it says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth for moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where none of those things happen. That's where ours is. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 says, in him, in Christ also, we have a obtained an inheritance. Again, obtained. Not we're obtaining, not that we hope to obtain. We have already <laughs> obtained, it's a sure thing for us, an inheritance. Being predestined. Not it's, again, it's, it's a completed thing. To the purpose of him, of God, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory, in whom you also trusted. Here's like the, what they call the, there's some big fancy theological thing, but the chain of events for salvation, right? In him you also trusted, in him you also believed, 
after you heard the word of truth. What does Romans say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we trusted in the gospel after we heard the word of truth, which was the gospel of your salvation, Paul says. In whom also, after you believed, had you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until uh, the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Isn't that fantastic? Our inheritance is kept safe and preserved by God himself, and that was the verse I was alluding to earlier in 1 Peter 3. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has gotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6 says, The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, the first half of that verse doesn't mean your wrinkles are nicely placed. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you to catch the joke. Okay, I'll move on. So when it says the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places, it was referring, you know, back how when they had the, the lots were cast when they assigned the land, when they went into the promised land. Uh, so he's basically saying my inheritance is, is a good, good thing. It's a pleasant thing because that verse reflects back on verse 5. Verse 7 says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. So again, this you can see how this would apply to the Lord as well. Um, as the Lord would thank God the Father for directing his steps in his earthly ministry. John 6, 17, or 7, 16, where he says, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. And John 8, 28 to 29 says, well, let's see. Um, I'll read the last half of verse 29 for time. He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Boy, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could make, make that statement? I always do things to please him. No, we're more like Paul. Uh, the things I want to do, if I can't manage to do it, the things I don't like doing, I'll find myself doing them. But the Lord could do that. He could say that. John 17, 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Does the world hate Christians today? Yeah, we're not of the world. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So in night seasons, um, people debate about what that means. Um, some think it means figuratively hard times, uh, adversity. Some things it means just simply at night, the nighttime, literally, that David would be praising the Lord. Uh, but either way, you know, it reminds you of Psalm 23, 4, um, ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So throughout Scripture, the right hand, that's position of power. You see that throughout. Um, if you go to, I'll just refer to it here. Uh, Acts 2.25, Peter was preaching his great Pentecost sermon, right? And uh, you know the context there. They're having this great showing of the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, of those people, they must be drunk. Peter's like, well, it's only nine in the morning. They're not drunk. So then he starts quoting in Acts 2.25, uh, Peter refers to this psalm where he says, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. So there, him refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is where um, 
we see Peter through the Holy Spirit looking back and bringing this forward to refer to Christ. Verse 9 says, Therefore my heart is glad and my heart, heart let me back up, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. So in the second verse, no, the next verse, Peter in Acts 2, 26, said, Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. So if you if we take Acts 2, 26 and put it back in Psalm 16, we see that uh, my glory rejoices. Peter interprets that to refer to the tongue. So it's his tongue that's rejoicing in God. So just as the body of Christ, it says um, his flesh will rest in hope. The body of Christ was placed into the tomb and it rested there in hope of the resurrection. It, it, it was not going to see corruption, which follows with, uh, verse 10 follows with that, where it says, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So again, Sheol is just the Hebrew word basically referred to the grave. Oftentimes in the Hebrew scripture, they'll tell you, when it speaks about the grave, it's just referring to the dirt. That's where you're at. Um, now Paul declared that after David's body was laid with his fathers, it saw corruption. But our Lord's didn't, right? We know that the they had a hurried up job when the ladies went there to prepare his body. So they went there on a Sunday to finish up the job and prep it properly and it, it was gone. Acts 13, 33 to 37. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus. Now, now we have, we had Peter speaking in Acts chapter two. Now we have Paul speaking on the same topic same subject and same conclusions. It says, He has raised up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. So now David, uh, Paul refers to the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, now refers to this one, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. So you see again, all these, all scripture agrees with itself. So note also that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the foundation of well, it, the resurrection was the foundation for both what Peter preached, the gospel he preached, and it was the foundation for the gospel that Paul preached. And in Corinthians uh, 15, 1 to 4, Paul states the basic facts of the gospel, and you probably can quote this by heart. Uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then if you skip down, same chapter, down to verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes a logical argument. That if there's no resurrection, then we're wasting our time. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now, I, I, I love his, just follow his, if this is true, then this is true, and if this is true, then that's true, and if that's not true, then, so just, anyway. Um, verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also, 
Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And here's uh, kind of the, it's the home run here. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And then no one uses those next two words better than Paul. But now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's the first. Remember, the, if you go back to the Old Testament scripture, the first fruit harvest, that was the guarantee of more harvest and crops to come, right? So Christ is the first fruit of resurrection, which is a guarantee of more resurrections to come. He, he just led the way. Verse 11, back uh, in Psalm 16, finishing up there, it says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of the Lord, there was fullness of of joy completeness of joy so that helps us to understand Paul when he said this in first in Philippians 1 21 for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain what does that mean more to die is gain gain what more to live is Christ and to die is more more what more Christ but if I live on in the flesh this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. And that verse has made me do a lot of thinking with no answers. Did Paul have a choice? I always wondered that. Did God say, well, Paul's up to you. What did you want? <laughs> Paul's going, ah, well, let's see. Man, if I stay here, that's more fruit, and, and I'll get, you know, I have a better reward, or yes, but man, to depart and be with Christ, He says, verse uh, 23, I am hard-pressed between the two. Now, in my interpretation, that's like, I, I can't decide. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, on the one hand, which is far better. Nevertheless, on the other hand, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Well, I'm not a spiritualist, Paul. So if God gave me the option, I'd say, I'm out of here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, well, I know it'd be better if I can help you out if I'm here. Mm -mm. I'm sorry, I'm selfish. I'd much rather be with the Lord. Like that, if I could say, right, okay, right now, absent the body, present with the Lord, there's no debate. There's no debate. So after his suffering on the cross, Talks about um, in his right hand of pleasures forevermore. Now, after his suffering on the cross and his resurrection, Scripture says that the Lord is now at the right hand of God. Colossians 3 1 says, If then, and that's the if of certainty, right, or since then, we could translate that, since then you were raised with Christ. And it's, it's, Paul makes he's making this logically again, like he did in Romans, right? Um, since you're raised with Christ it's only lost for that you seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God in a position of authority and rulership um, the writer of Hebrews says the same thing in Hebrews 12.2 he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't you like that? We're, we're not in there. He started it. He finished it. Alpha and Omega. The Lord, all of our faith, all of our salvation is bound up in him, like it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's a gift of God, not of works, so city magicals. It's all from him. But it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, or he thought nothing of it. He didn't recount it from anything. And now he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Paul said it. The writer of Hebrews said it. 
And Peter said it in 1 Peter 3, 21 to 22. Now, it's interesting that people who believe in water baptism doing them any good, I guess they skip this verse, because Peter makes it clear that water does nothing for your salvation. He says, there is also an anti-type which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers. Now, I like how Peter puts it, having been made subject to him. So again, in God's mind, again, this will, it blows my mind and probably blows your too. We think of what happened yesterday what is happening today and what will happen tomorrow, right? We have, we're locked into this time continuum of past, present, future. But try to wrap your mind, your mind around the fact that with God, everything is present tense. It, it just is right there. So when God can say, having been made subject, that's, that's we, don't, we, we look at it and we go back to, wait a minute, that's not going to happen until Revelation when he comes back and takes care of business, right? Judges the world. But no, it says, as far as God is concerned, angels and authorities and powers have already been made subject to the Lord. So the prophetic word is, is sure, and um, we know that it's going to happen because it says in John, thy word is truth, and we know that his word will come to pass because he is still the sovereign God of the universe. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you how your word is consistent and faithful, and it gives us hope for our sure future in you. Lord, we look forward to that day when we will have it as reality and be in your presence for eternity. In your name we pray. Amen.